Thanks, Alistair, and thank you to the organising committee for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, yes, I got the brief of plant responses to stress, and I thought, well, I can think of a plant that I can perhaps use as a model plant to describe plant responses to stress to you. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I thank my co-authors for this, and I also thank um, the Hill Country Futures sponsors that are sponsoring most of my research at the moment. What I wanted to do is understand how your plant is responding to the different things that happen. So if you take nothing else away from this lecture, remember this. If your plant is limited for carbon, then its priority will be to grow leaves and its root biomass will decline. So if it's limited for carbon, it means it hasn't got its photosynthetic area available, you've taken the leaves off too quickly, it will take carbon from its roots and put it into its shoots. If it's limited for water or nitrogen, it will do the opposite. Immediately, before you even see you have a water stress, you have a reduction in leaf area expansion, so you have a reduction in the solar panel. And the plant is prioritizing by putting carbon and nitrogen under the ground to go and seek the water and nitrogen that it wants. So two different stress responses, carbon, water, and nitrogen. So at some point, we must allow our plants to rebuild its reserves, either seasonally or within rotations. So, Plants 101. Actually, there's a big yellow thing out there that gives us unlimited energy. Our job is to capture it. The solar panel is what we've got to capture it with. That's the leaf area. So how much photosynthetically active radiation do we intercept? The ability of a plant to convert that into dry matter is actually fairly limited. It's the same for a C3 plant. All our grasses have about the same conversion efficiency. Our C4s have a different conversion efficiency. And then we have demands on the plant, put it to the leaf, put it to the stem, put it to the root, and sometimes we have it going between the root and the shoot. But it comes back to the most important component of growing pasture is how much light did I intercept. And there is our green canopy capturing light. That's our energy capture device. And our energy capture device is only at its most efficient doing the best job when there are three and a half meters of green leaf area per meter of ground. Not when it's skint set stopped, but when there are three and a half meters of leaf per meter of ground, do we intercept all of that available radiation? My lucerne plant also does the other thing of it says, well, I'll try and help the shoots grow in the spring by remobilizing some of my underground reserves. And so it grows more than we would expect in that spring period because it's remobilizing from under the ground. So if we think about a balanced system, what we want is the shoot growth coming in, giving carbon fixation to the, to the shoot, and it transports that to the root. The root, in turn, is grabbing nitrogen and water from the soil, and that nitrogen is being provided to the shoot. So in the middle of spring, my root biomass declines and my, to keep my shoot biomass growing. In the autumn, that low root biomass increases again, and I get a reduction in my shoot biomass. So anybody that's ever tried to manage a lucerne stand knows that you get the bulk of your feed in the spring. We've developed management systems based on that to say, you know what, this plant is quite flexible, we can actually graze it in the spring quite early, but if we graze it too early or too hard, then we're going to easily be able to see that we are not capturing all of the light available here. Light is instantaneous. Light hits the ground, it's lost from the system. Water and nutrients are retained in the soil, but light is instantaneous. Capture it or you've lost it. So what we do with our lucerne is obviously give it a rest in the autumn to allow it to recharge those reserves. What we wanted to do was we understood the principles of that. We wanted to see what would happen if we defoliated our crop like a bad manager or we maybe left it a really long time to regenerate. So we had three treatments in an experiment, a 28-day, 42- and 84-day, and we had three different genetics. Irrigated... So no water stress, no nitrogen stress. We're just looking at the impact of defoliation. What we found was, as you can see, we've got this pattern of up and down happening seasonally over five years for our six-week rotation. When we defoliate too quickly or too frequently, we have less root reserves. We have a carbon deficiency. We have reduced 
the root reserves. That dotted line is two, um, two tons of biomass, which is actually the structural biomass. So when we hit that dotted line, it means there is actually no reserves less. But if I leave my plant for a long time, I can get up to 10 tons of biomass below ground. This is simply what grazing management does to your underground reserves. The same thing happens with a grass plant. So, in my 28-day defoliation, I'm removing the carbon too quickly, I'm taking away the solar panel, and I'm reducing the root reserves. In my um, excessively long period of rotation, I actually build up the roots, and I allow the shoot growth to be a bit more. Balancing those two is what pasture management or grazing management is about. We can actually look at that from a perspective of what happens within a rotation or a cycle of a plant growing. When it first has been defoliated, it has to use its reserves, so it remobilizes reserves from underground to try and re-expand the leaf area. And then at some point, it starts putting it back under the ground. For our, mod, for our normal lucerne variety used in New Zealand, an FD5 plant, that takes about 300 thermal units. And I won't go into explaining what that is, simply to show that for a more winter dormant plant, it spends less of its time remobilizing and more of its time putting things under the ground. If we take a more winter active plant, it actually spends more of its time in the rotation remobilizing from below ground and less time in the rotation putting it below ground. If you don't handle the diagram, that's fine. The consequences of this are fairly easy to see. This is a five-year-old lucerne stand at Lincoln for a traditional FD5 or a normal New Zealand cultivar. Some gaps opening up. The FD2 winter active, a uh, winter dormant one is showing not so many gaps, but my, my defoliated um, FD10 has grown itself to death. It's effectively never had any time to put reserves under the ground. We always think about dry matter production, but we don't think about what's going on below ground. So, my carbon partitioning for lucerne is different in spring and autumn. The management that I put on it makes a big difference in what happens. A 28-day or a too-frequent defoliation depletes reserves. I need a long rotation at some point to build it up, and I've got genetic differences um, within the plant species. What can we take from that to understand about how grasses do? Well, grasses do the same thing. This is intensive grazing management. This is as intensive as you can get. This is, let's mow the grass every day, sometimes twice a day, and defoliate it, so it is always short of carbon. Now, even the worst grazing managers in the room are not as bad as somebody who's a greenkeeper. And what happens to those plants is they have no roots. So my turf manager colleague that's visiting us at the moment says, you can do this provided you provide water and nitrogen the whole time. I've got no roots, and I've got no leaf area. So guess which plant survives really well under that sort of a management? Brown top as the basis of the golf greens because that's the sort of management it handles really well. What about our perennial ryegrass? Well, some people have done some really fancy work and shown us, thankfully, what happens within a grazing cycle for ryegrass plants, and they show us that we need to get to about three green leaves to allow those um, pseudo-stem reserves to replenish. And then I look at the extension material and it says, at about two green leaves, you can graze your ryegrass plant. And I'm going, how come the science and the extension material no longer match up? It takes about three green leaves to allow the pseudo-stem of the baby of their grasses, we've all heard it, you know, this hopeless ryegrass plant, it's, it really needs looking after and it needs that opportunity to take its reserves and, and um, build up reserves below ground. If we, and therefore we rotationally graze. That's the reason that it's rotationally grazed. If we don't and we set stock, we actually deplete reserves and reduce our yield potential. So if we're early set stocking for too long, our root and our shoot potential both decline. If we have a water or nitrogen deficiency, the first thing that happens is we lose leaf area. And so when we lose that leaf area, we initially start looking for increased root growth. But over time, when we get into a drought, we have prolonged stress. Those prolonged stress then still have animals grazing on them. And eventually our root and our shoot start to decline 
to the point that our plant is running on empty. And what we need to do is understand this dynamic that is existing within our plants and recognize it and understand the plant that we are trying to manage. So our dryland management options, minimize set, set stocking. Allow your pastures to get three meters of green leaf area per meter of ground so you can intercept all of the available light, but also stop evaporation of the soil and make it go through the plant as transpiration. That's the key to growing more pasture in a dryland system. Taprooted species we've heard about, winter annuals we promote because they're growing at a time when other plants aren't. Nitrogen in spring, nitrogen's not the devil's tool. Nitrogen is actually required to grow leaf area. If you don't have leaf area, you don't capture sunshine. It's a fairly straightforward message. Flexible stock policies, we haven't got time to go into those, but identify high-yielding paddocks. Identify the 10 hectares on your farm that can have a really high-quality feed in it that will service the other 90 hectares in a block. Take that block, put it into red clover and plantain or lucerne, whatever it might be. Increase the stocking rate on that period. Get rid of the cull ewes. Allow a little more pasture growth on the other 90 hectares, and very quickly you don't run into shortages. Identify your legume and manage it. In our summer moist areas, minimize set stocking, unless you want brown top. If you want to farm brown top, fantastic. Get out there and do so. Adjust your rotation lengths for a route to allow for recharge. Gray, graze ryegrass at the appropriate leaf stage. Somebody did a PhD on really fundamental work and said, this is when you graze ryegrass. And we forgot to listen to that message. Recognize nitrogen or water deficiencies happen early and before you've even thought about it, you've lost leaf area. And that leaf area means you've lost light interception, so you've lost carbon. Increase our rotation lengths rather than shorten them. Feed out some supplements. Recognize that ryegrass is the baby of our grasses. It's the one that needs to be looked after the most. Tall fescue's a bit more resilient, cockswood even more, and brown top, well, if you want it, go for it. And if your plant's under stress, it will also attra attract pests. So hopefully, I've covered Plant Science 101. Thank you very much.